You know, instead of trying to live for Christ, we're meant to live in Christ, in His power, in His resources. The fire in our bones. Mm. This is Living Truth. Before we dive into this chapter, I just want to take us back to last week, to chapter 16. Last week, we looked at how Abram and Sarah hatched a plan, uh, and in their barrenness, in their famine that they were facing, they turned again to Egypt for provision. And the plan they hatched with Hagar and giving birth to Ishmael. And I just want to draw your attention as we dive into today's text to something that's stated at the end of uh, Genesis 16. It says this, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And then chapter 17 opens with this, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. That's a period of 13 years, 13 years of silence in the story. A long time has passed in the account of Abram between Genesis 16 and Genesis 17. And for 13 years, Abram and Sarah believed that the plan with Hagar had worked. God had provided an heir for him, a son, through which he could pass down his uh, legacy. And God allows Abram to live with this understanding for 13 years. That's a sobering thought, that we could, for a long extended period of time, think that we're living in line with God's agenda, only to discover 13 years later that we are way off course And so it begs the question, why the wait? Why does God wait for so long before stepping back into the story? Well, simply put, God was waiting for their strength to give out. He waited for them to come to the end of their resources, the end of their abilities. He waited until there would be no other explanation as to the miraculous birth of a child to Sarah unless it was explained by God himself. Now, there's multiple clues that God was waiting for their strength to give out, and it's revealed in Genesis 17 alone. Uh, Later in the text, in verse 17, we read, Abraham fell face down. He laughed, and he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? I mean, even when God reveals to him that the promised child will come through Sarah, Abraham laughs out loud, laughs to himself and, and struggles to understand this reality. In Genesis chapter 18, when Sarah overhears the angel explaining that she's going to have a child, uh, we read in Genesis 18:11, Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? So we see even within the biblical characters in their day, they're laughing about this. They think to themselves, when I'm worn out, when I'm very old, is this now going to happen? God waited for 13 years for them to come to the end of their abilities. Now, Paul picks this storyline up in the New Testament in Romans chapter 4, and he actually puts it in even stronger language what's going on here. We read in Romans 4.18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Basically, Paul's saying there was no hope of them having children. There was no possible explanation for this to happen. Uh, Paul goes on in verse 19 of Romans 4, and he said this, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. I mean, the scriptures don't mince words. Abraham was old, his body as good as dead, against all hope, against all odds. 
God waits for 13 years until there was no hope, no strength, no power other than him. He waits for Abraham's weakness to grow before the promise comes to pass. This chapter is very sobering because what it reveals is that you can be attending church, you can be going about your business thinking that you're living in the good of God's promises, but you can actually be doing it in your own strength or power. And it begs the question, are you living in the sufficiency of who he is or are you trying to live in self-sufficiency? Do you, depend, do you depend upon his power or do you live by your own power? You see, we need to embrace our weakness and rest in his strength. The gospel is all about that reality. We are saved not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did on the cross. But the reality is we also live our Christian lives in dependence upon Christ at work within us. Paul refers to the reality of embracing our weakness, and he talks about it in his very own ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul, speaking about his own ministry and his own weaknesses, he writes this, Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul states, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, instead of trying to live for Christ, we're meant to live in Christ, in his power, in his resources. And God waits for Abram and Sarah's weakness to be evident to them. And then he enters back into Abraham's story. Now, I am so grateful that our low points aren't the, the end of God's activity in our lives. God doesn't let the disobedience of Abraham and Sarah be the end of the story. God steps back into their story, even if they've wandered off track, and he picks up. God enters into Abraham's life in a pretty strong way in chapter 17, and his primary message to Abraham again is, I am sufficient. He states this in verse 1. He says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. I am El Shaddai. I am the God over everything. I am the God who takes care of everything. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. What he's saying to Abraham is, it's like God saying, I don't need your help in fulfilling my promises. I am sufficient to carry out my plans without your assistance, without your help. This whole chapter is about God reminding Abraham of his sufficiency and Abraham surrendering to who God is. See, there's a few things you need to note in this chapter when you study it carefully. The whole chapter is pretty much God speaking. There's one sentence that Abraham speaks in the whole chapter, and it consists of three speeches where God's revealing what he's going to do. And basically, every time God speaks, he's speaking with divine imperatives. They're imperative verbs that he utters. So he is basically voicing commands to Abraham throughout the whole chapter. The tone and sensibility, if you will, of chapter 17 is that after 13 years of silence, God comes with a pretty strong presence and reminds Abraham of his sufficiency, and we witness Abraham's surrender to who God is. It's as though Abraham is again subdued by God's grace. Now, we hear that word subdued, and we kind of think of it in a negative way. We think of it as uh, God putting his boot on Abraham's neck. That's not what I'm describing at all. Think of it more in a Psalm 131 way, where 
Abraham is at peace with who God is. Abraham, in a positive way, is reminded of God's ability and strength to take care of every detail of his life. God opens with that reminder. And we read in Genesis 17, verse 3, that Abraham fell face down before God when he revealed this to him. You know, our generation of Christianity grew up, my generation at least, grew up with a lot of hellfire and brimstone. And out of all of our trauma of that, if you will, or our uh, lopsided perspective as to who God is, there's a, big cons- a concerted effort in our culture and in our day and age to emphasize the positive things of God, the, the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, all which are true and I would affirm completely. But the danger is we can swing the pendulum so far towards those aspects of who he is that we lose sight of the grandeur and the strength of who God is. And God steps into chapter 17 and and he says again to Abram, I am God Almighty. And what we see of Abraham is that he rightfully falls on his face when confronted by who God is. And then God speaks of a litany of I will statements. God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God basically reaffirms all his promises to Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations and kings will come from you. And I am now establishing my covenant, not just with you, but with your descendants after you. In the grand narrative of scripture, God is revealing to us that out of all of the families on the earth, God has chosen Abraham's descendants as unique and set apart people through whom he will ultimately reveal who he is. Through their story, his ultimate plan of salvation will come to pass. Out of all the nations, I have chosen this one to make myself known to all the other nations. And then God gives Abraham a sign of this new covenant. Now, Abraham might have been thinking to himself, ooh, I'm so excited to get a sign. I mean, Noah was given a sign and it was a rainbow. So maybe Abraham's looking forward to this sign, this this covenant agreement that displays the unique relationship that he and his descendants would enjoy. But then in verse 9, God says to Abraham, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That is probably not the covenant sign that Abraham had in mind. But God makes himself clear in the following verses. Three times he emphasizes that this is the covenant agreement that they shall bear this mark in their flesh. Three times he says, you are to do it. Your household, whether slave or free, is to do it. Your descendants after you are to do this. This is to be an everlasting covenant. It's as though God is making himself abundantly clear by repeating it four times, by mentioning it four times. Yeah, you heard me correctly, Abraham. This is what I want you to do. Now, I always wonder to myself, Abraham's 99 years old at this point, and the Lord has appeared to him and just told him that he's to observe the covenant of circumcision. And I kind of think to myself, how did that go over with the rest of Abraham's household when he went home that day? But what I find interesting about the covenant sign that God has just given Abraham, I find it interesting that the very instrument Abraham used to bring about Ishmael is the very instrument that God cuts at 
in Genesis 17. I just wonder to myself sometimes, if Abraham hadn't slept with Hagar and gave, given birth to Ishmael, would God have provided him a different sign of the covenant? I wonder sometimes, are the two correlated? I wonder this because later in the scriptures, when the Israelites enter into the promised land, we're told that the Israelites who were born in the wilderness had not been circumcised. And so they get circumcised in the early part of the book of Joshua. And in Joshua 5 verse 9, we read this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. That was after they had been circumcised. And I wonder in Genesis 17, if the reproach of Abraham turning to Egypt for an heir had to be removed from Abraham. This would be a reminder to him and future generations not to live by their own strength and abilities, but to trust that God was going to bring about the promise by his own strength and his own abilities. And God uses the strongest possible language to get this covenant across. In verse 13, he says, my covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. In the Hebrew language, what God is saying is, basically, if you don't observe this, if you don't carry this out, you will be cut off. Your life will have a sudden end to it. You will be cut off from me. And then God surprises Abraham at this point because, again, Abraham might be thinking that Ishmael is the fulfillment of the promises. And verse 15, God also says to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. That was probably a big surprise to Abraham, now 99 years old. Sarah is actually the one I'm going to carry my promise through. That plan that you hatched 13 years ago, that wasn't my original plan. That was you trying to fulfill my promises by your own efforts and strength. But my plan is actually through the barren one. And we're told in verse 17 that Abraham for the second time fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And then Abraham speaks his one sentence to God, and he says, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. You know, what I find amazing about this chapter is that God embraces the laughter of Abraham. I, I find that remarkable that, that God doesn't rebuke him, but embraces that laughter. And then he riddles Abraham with more I will statements. He says, uh, yes, I will bless Ishmael, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. I find God in his grace and his mercy still takes Abraham and Sarah's mistake with Ishmael and still blesses and watches over Ishmael. But he says to Abraham, my whole plan was actually Sarah. And that laughter will be the name of your son. You know, what you see in Genesis 17 is that there is a subduing of Abraham in Genesis 17. And 
God speaks in strong commands, and it's a surprising revelation to Abraham, who for 13 years thought that the plan with Hagar had succeeded. But look at Abraham's response to all of this new information from God. We read in verse 23, on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God had told him. On that very day, Abraham carried out the commands of God. Because again, God had uttered these commands in a very strong way. In essence, he had said to him, cut it off or you will be cut off from my blessing. In Genesis 17, God calls Abram back to rest in the sufficiency of who he is. I am El Shaddai, the God over everything. And there is a a surrender displayed by Abraham to the sufficiency of who God is. Abraham walks blamelessly by depending on God's sufficiency. Now, the Apostle Paul revisits this whole chapter of Scripture in the New Testament. In a letter that he writes to the Colossians, he helps us understand all of this strange sign from a New Covenant gospel perspective. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, we read this, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Think about that statement. In Christ, all the fullness lives, present tense, in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought into that fullness. In Christ, you don't lack anything. You have been brought into his fullness with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And Paul goes on in verse 11, and he says this, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And Paul's explaining that when we place our faith in Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, we are conjoined with him, we have been crucified with Christ, and through baptism, it's the new sign, it's the new symbol of our circumcision, of us cutting away the old self, the flesh, and being raised in newness of life. Paul goes on in verse 13, and he continues to explain it. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise to humanity. He is the all-sufficient one. He is El Shaddai, and in him we are lacking nothing. He came and performed an everlasting circumcision, brought about by the Spirit, one that removes the reproach of sin from us. Through baptism, we have buried the flesh, and through baptism, we are raised in newness of life. He is our sufficiency, and he is everything we need for life and godliness. Just as God said to Abraham, I am El Shaddai, I am the God over everything, I am the God who takes care of everything. In the New Testament, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. And we walk in newness of life because of who he is, and we walk a blameless life by depending on his resources at work within us.
Join us next week for the continuation of this series. This is Living Truth. Sing with me. The Father sent us His only Son that we would know His grace. Our sin is vanquished. The work is done. Our Savior took our place. Yeah. He's the truth, the truth, the life, the only way. Who will go tell the world Jesus saves? Here I am. Yeah, let's sing that again, the truth.